Welcome back to Dietrich Labs for another installment of my quantum mechanics lecture series. In this one, we're going to be constructing the interaction picture, specifically in the context of setting up for quantum mechanical time-dependent perturbation theory. However, you can just relabel the terms in the Hamiltonian and use the treatment here for any application for the interaction picture. Beyond those labels, it doesn't change any. Let's get going. In quantum mechanics class, people usually encounter two different ways of including time evolution in quantum mechanics. One that places time dependence in the state vectors, leaving the operators time independent. This formalism is called the Schrodinger picture, and it dictates that time evolution of these states must satisfy the Schrodinger equation. And given this equation, we have this simple solution for that time evolution, at least for the case of time independent Hamiltonian. If we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, an explicitly time-dependent Hamiltonian, specifically where we have a potential that carries explicit time dependence, meaning it's time-dependent even in the Schrodinger picture, then, at least for the case where it commutes with itself at different times, we have this relatively intuitive generalization of this time evolution operator up here for the time-independent case. In the general case, where a Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself at different times, we have this type of Dyson series right here, where subsequent t's are later in time. Now this solution looks pretty complicated. It can be written more elegantly as a time-ordered exponential, but that's not important enough for this particular video in order for me to go through that, so we'll just leave it at this for now. Now I'm also going to skip deriving this expression too, because I'll go through a detailed derivation of the Dyson series in the interaction picture for the purpose of doing time dependent perturbation theory in the next video. And while the result we get is a little different, it's so close to this one that the derivation doesn't really need to be changed. At some point, I might make a separate video on this calculation exactly. It will likely appear earlier in my lecture series than this video. Now, despite the fact that it is just a Schrodinger picture version of the calculation that I'm going to do in the next video, it still actually isn't easy to use for perturbation theory because it treats the Hamiltonian in one piece. And you'll see what I mean by that as we continue on. The other common picture that you see in quantum mechanics class places time dependence in the operators, leaving the state vectors time independent. And that's, of course, the Heisenberg picture. It dictates operator time evolution by requiring them to satisfy the Heisenberg equation in motion, which is famously just this. Of course, you can work the derivation forward and reverse, but in textbooks, this equation is usually derived by differentiating the formula that defines the Heisenberg picture operators in terms of the Schrodinger picture operators. They usually start with the Schrodinger picture and then introduce the Heisenberg picture in that manner. If we take the time of equivalence to be zero for convenience, we have this usual definition for a Heisenberg picture operator in terms of a Schrodinger picture operator, and again, the time of equivalence is zero, as you can see across this equality. We can then differentiate that and simplify, and of course we do just get the Heisenberg equation in motion. Conversely, it's also easy to derive the Schrodinger equation by differentiating the formula for the Schrodinger picture states in terms of the Heisenberg picture states, which are, of course, time independent. And again, we have across this equality just the statement that the time of equivalence is zero, which is arbitrary, but again, convenient. And if we actually sit down and do the time derivative, we, of course, just get that Schrodinger equation that we had, and we see that this is nothing more than inserting the solution that we had for the time-independent Hamiltonian case back into the Schrodinger equation. Like the Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg picture can also handle explicitly time-dependent Hamiltonians if we modify the Heisenberg equation in motion a little bit. Specifically, any time an operator acquires explicit time dependence, we must add this term here to account for that. This equation being consistent with the obvious generalization of the transformation relations between the two pictures, that generalization being this time evolution operator, which applies in the arbitrary case even when the Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself at different times. It perhaps is slightly annoying that we're writing this in terms of the Schrodinger picture operators there, but that is the most convenient way to do it. And of course, given that this does depend on Hamiltonians at different times, and the Hamiltonian may not commute with itself at different times, 
we have that the Heisenberg picture Hamiltonian is no longer the same as the Schrodinger picture Hamiltonian because these can't necessarily pass through the Schrodinger picture Hamiltonian and cancel this out there. This all seems fine and dandy, but as we will come to see in future videos, there are problems in quantum mechanics that aren't very simple to handle in either one of these pictures, the most important being the one that I'm setting this video up around, and that is the construction of time-dependent perturbation theory. Now, to keep this video from being too long and to have a nice bi-topic breakdown of the videos in my quantum mechanics lecture series, I'm going to save the development of an actual perturbation series for another video, probably the next one, but I will cover enough in this setup here to properly motivate the interaction picture in quite a convenient way. The interaction picture being the alternative to the Heisenberg picture and the Schrodinger picture that make it much easier to perform the process of constructing such a perturbation series. We will again take a Hamiltonian similar to that of time independent perturbation theory where we can divide the Hamiltonian into two parts, one that's exactly solvable and time independent, and the other which is small. The key difference being that the potential perturbation is now time dependent. You may perhaps now begin to see the problem. The perturbation introduces time dependence into the Hamiltonian, which means that the separation of time and space variables that conventional perturbation theory is based on no longer applies. Now you may say, well, I'll just come up with some entirely different expansion that gets around that cleverly. Well, it's pretty hard to come up with an expansion that does that in the Schrodinger picture. And also remember that the time-ordered exponential given above isn't easy to use as a perturbation theory anyway because it includes the Hamiltonian as a whole and it's not really easy to directly break that up. Remember that we seek to expand in powers of the potential perturbation or more exactly powers of a constant coefficient of it. In the Heisenberg picture it's also difficult to figure out a reasonable way to handle the problem because the Hamiltonian both controls time dependence and is time dependent itself. Of course at some level in principle the Heisenberg picture could still be used to do this because of the generalized Heisenberg equation that I showed you above. However, that doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, coming up with a convenient way to develop a perturbative expansion in the Heisenberg picture is no easier than it is in the Schrodinger picture. There's actually another issue with attempting a simple time-dependent generalization of usual perturbation theory, where we still try to calculate energy eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and this one is from energy time uncertainty. And this issue is actually more fundamental than the other two. The other two are just that it would be difficult to handle. However, this objection I'm going to get to from energy time uncertainty actually is a fundamental one. It means there's something actually in principle wrong with the idea of doing that and it will cause us to have to change exactly what we're trying to calculate in perturbation theory not just how we do it. In the usual time independent scenarios we can know slash calculate exact energy eigenvalues and eigenstates because the time independence of the Hamiltonian means that one can state exact energy eigenstates and eigenvalues while still leaving the time completely undetermined. As soon as there is sensitivity to time in the Hamiltonian this can no longer be done exactly without violating energy time uncertainty. We can however answer the following much more useful question question for time-dependent scenarios, and that question is, what probability does a particle have of being knocked from a given initial energy eigenstate to a given final energy eigenstate by some particular, localized in time, time-dependent potential perturbation? These probabilities being called transition probabilities and their corresponding amplitudes that you square to get them being called, of course, transition amplitudes. It is the answer to this question that is the usual target of time-dependent perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. Now, after hearing this, you might be a bit confused, and I understand, and let's review exactly what it is that we've uh, covered so far and see what we can gather from that before moving on forward. So the first thing we did, of course, was we summarized the Heisenberg and Schrodinger pictures of quantum mechanics, what you're probably already familiar with, and then after doing that we started considering this idea of developing a time-dependent generalization of the perturbation theory we'd already done, the time-independent perturbation theory, specifically where we calculate energy eigenstates and eigenvalues for the case of a potential perturbation that's not exactly solvable and is not time-dependent, can we just straight up generalize that to the case 
of time dependence. And the first thing we were noticing is that there's obvious calculational tractability issues with using the Schrodinger or the Heisenberg picture to try and do that. However, with this new thing that I've just thrown at you, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for energy and time, instead of just facing a tractability issue that requires us to find a new way of calculating the same thing, we're learning that we can't calculate those things exactly in the presence of a time-dependent Hamiltonian, even in theory, there's an uncertainty principle getting in the way. So we have to change what quantity we're even trying to calculate to begin with. So where the heck does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in essentially the same place we had before, and the reason is because if we are to try to calculate this transition amplitude so that we can get the transition probabilities, we're still solving the same equations. Transition amplitudes are made up out of time-evolved states or operators, and they satisfy the previously given equations of motion. So we're still trying to expand those same equations of motion, even though we've changed what quantity it is that we're expanding after noticing this issue with the energy and time uncertainty. So maybe all of this has seemed like a disaster, one problem after another, and and technically we haven't resolved that tractability issue, but at least this latest one isn't anything additional to that. It really is true that in time-dependent scenarios, the transition amplitudes give you essentially anything you could want. So the loss of the ability to calculate exact energy eigenvalues and eigenstates actually isn't as much of a loss as you might initially think. And the switch to calculating them as our goal, of course, doesn't add to the tractability issue. It just leads us to the same one that we had before. So maybe it was looking bad and then it was looking worse, but in reality, it, we're just back to bad again. Now let's get on to setting up what will turn out to be the solution, really, in the next video of the tractability issue, which of course, as the title implies, and as other things I've said in this video imply, is the interaction picture. The magic of the interaction picture, which gives it the ability to resolve this problem, is that it splits the encoding of time dependence right down the line between the time independent and time dependent parts of the Hamiltonian. Specifically, we take full advantage of the fact that there are two kinds of objects in this theory that could carry time dependence, both states and operators, to break apart the problem. Specifically, we make these definitions. Here, at least in some sense, we have the usual kind of time dependence a time-independent Hamiltonian in the usual phases, controlling operator time evolution, but of course the difference being that the time evolution of the interaction picture operators is clearly controlled only by the time-independent exactly solvable part of the Hamiltonian, and then the time evolution of the states is modified somehow by a similar phase factor. The fact that this does cleanly break apart the two different kinds of time dependence, as I promised, becomes clear when we calculate the equations of motion. Let's Let's work out the operator equation first. We have this starting point. We can get the operator equation just like we get the Heisenberg equation in motion for the Heisenberg picture. We simply evaluate that time derivative and we get what really is just a Heisenberg equation in motion, but controlled by just the solvable time independent portion of the Hamiltonian. So that's the first inkling that we're going to get a nice clean break between the two sources of time dependence. Now we can do the equation in motion for the states, and perhaps by now you're expecting this, if we leverage the Schrodinger equation for states, we can reduce this down to a different kind of Schrodinger equation for interaction picture states, where the Hamiltonian is just the time dependent part of the Hamiltonian, and that's really quite interesting. In principle, we could have broken apart the Hamiltonian any which way we want. There's no particular requirement that this definition of H0 be some exactly solvable part, or that the other part be time dependent, so that's where you'll find other applications of the interaction picture, but in our case that's how we're breaking it down, and we do in fact see that clean separation of the two different sources of time dependence like I was talking about. And in the next video, just after this one, at least in the quantum mechanics lecture series, we will see that the interaction picture does deliver the solution to the tractability problem that I was talking about before. It does in fact allow us to relatively easily develop a very nice time-dependent perturbative power expansion for the transition amplitudes. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.